Yeah, we're here to talk about cats. Um, and let me just, before we get started, uh, I'll say a little bit about myself. My name is Michael O'Connor, but there's nobody besides my mother left on the planet who actually calls me Michael, so everyone should call me Stu. Um, and if you want to know why, you can ask me personally some other time. Uh, I'm currently a software architect for a division of Verizon called OnQ. Um, we're based in San Jose. We um, have, uh, we're doing lots and lots of Scala. Uh, we have, um, in the location where I work, there is triple digits of Scala developers. Um, so lots and lots of Scala. And we're doing lots of uh, functional programming. It's lots of Scala Z, that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, I originally had signed up to talk about something else, to talk about one of my Verizon projects. Um, but uh, John then, I you know, I talked to him about me, you know, he, he talked to me about talking about cats, and he was like, oh, God, can we talk about cats? Can we talk about cats? Because he thought it would have a much more broader appeal. Um, to people, and I said, you know, uh, it is true, cats and the internet seem to go hand in hand, so <laughs> we're going to start off with, um, you know, we're going to start off with a category that I think a lot of people are going to be familiar with, which is the, the domestic cats, uh, feline domesticus. <laughs> Maybe we'll get into some medium-sized cats like ocelots and bobcats later, but no, okay. All right, this will be my only site gag. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, how many people here in the room, let's say, use Scala Z? Excellent. And how many people have heard of cats? How many people know exactly what cats is? OK, so I'm hoping that um, what we, uh, I, I really, I've, I've prepared some stuff to talk about, um, but my plan was really to kind of to have this be an introduction to cats uh, and to talk about what we're doing. Uh, why we're doing it, uh, how it relates to Scala Z, um, um, and all that stuff. But um, I want you guys to stop me if you ever have questions. I don't, you know, I don't have. I have a. I have a, a deck full of slides that I want to try to get through. But I really just want it to be a, uh, a guidelines of things that we can talk about. If there's anything you want to talk about or questions you have to ask, you know, of me, just stop me. Ask me questions. I'm happily to pull up a REPL if we need to. I'm happy to use this whiteboard that seems to be black um, and uh, so just uh, you know stop me as we we go along the way so um, cats is a, another library which is trying to kind of occupy the same space as Scala Z it's doing the things it, we're hoping that it's going to be a library we'd use at times when you might use Scala Z so um, it's there to enable pure functional programming in Scala um, and so uh, it's a project that was recently started. Uh, it's a couple months old now. I don't remember exactly when we started. Um, but uh, it's uh, was started initially by uh, Eric Osheim, who is um, well known for being the, one of the primary authors of the Spire project um, and someone who uh, also now Algebra and a few, you know, lots of other uh, great stuff in Scala. A lot of people here, I assume, know who we're talking about. Um, when the project was started, it was clear that like there was a lot of um, excitement about it. We, uh, uh, like I said, it's only been a couple months old, and we already have I think thirty contributors to the project. Um, all right, who here? Who here has contributed cats already? Right, there's a there's a handful of us here already, which is great. Um, and you know, also just you know, to to, to show how excited people were um, when you know we all kind of knew that something was coming, we, that we were going to start some new functional programming library, and you know there were a bunch of people that had tossed some stuff out on GitHub. Mike Pilquist created his structures project, which was kind of be in the same place. I had some stuff I was playing with. I know um, I'm sure that other people did. Um, Eric was the first one to finally said, "All right, here it is. It's called Cats." Um, and uh, once he threw it up on GitHub, you know, within the first week, we had already merged a hundred pull requests, which I think, you know, uh, it shows like how excited people were for so for this new, um, you know, this new library to come around. Uh, so some of the goals of the project is that we're uh, we're trying to keep it small, um, and you know, small modular. Um, but, but I think the, one of the things that we're going to try and use as an underlying goal, which is really important, is we're going to try and make it uh, approachable and, and you know, friendly to newcomers. Uh, so 
it, a lot of you were in the room for the previous two talks, which were also about Scala's Ed, and you know uh, they feel like um, you know I know Brandon and Colt both said, okay, Scala's Ed, it's that thing that you were so scared of because it was like, oh my God, my head's going to explode, and you know, and it, this is a a common problem people have trying to come to these these uh, these ideas that are in these libraries, be, you know, and and these these problems come from them not being complicated, but actually being very simple, but. Um, so what we, we, we've been doing, um, you know, something I'm going to go back to over and over again, probably over the, over the course of the talk, is that it's been really uh, fun to um, take a library like this. And Scala Z, you know, it's on version 7, uh, and it's gone through, you know, many, many, sometimes very drastic iterations. Um, but uh, it, it's been really fun to be able to create a new library um, and really get to rethink uh, and revisit a lot of the decisions we made um, in the past and, and, and think about, okay, what, right now we don't have any users, right? You don't have to worry about like, well, we can't change this because if we do, we're gonna break, you know, break code for a lot of people. It's like, no, no, one, no one's using this yet. Um, so you know, we get to really revisit and rethink some of this stuff. And so when we uh, rethink some of this stuff, we're, we're um, trying to all the time say, now let me try and think of this um, from the perspective of a newcomer and, and try to, um, figure out how we can make this library so it doesn't have to be that, you know, so that a couple of years from now, you know, Brandon isn't standing up and being like, cats, you know that thing you're so scared of that you never wanted to use? So, you know, we're, we're hoping that we can do that. And, you know, we're, we're um, um, in the chat room and stuff, we're all the time talking about, uh, a lot of people are saying like, okay, so I was trying to teach my coworkers about, you know, uh, disjunction, you know, the, the uh, left slash, uh, right slash, and, you know, talking about was that a problem for people? Did people have, um, find that, that, that syntax off-putting or not? And, and trying to sometimes say, you know, well, I really like that syntax, and that syntax is natural for me. Um, we're trying to maybe make some compromises on what I like based on, on what someone who is newly coming to the, the library might think. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, Again, another, another uh, way that we're going to try and make things more approachable is that I especially am trying to be a little bit hard-assed about saying um, if you're going you know, to put it into the library, um, I want it to be documented. Um, and we're, we're not, you know, we don't have 100% coverage. I'd like to get 100% coverage. I'd like to see, see everything that goes into the CATS library be documented, have examples. Um, and um, and the other thing that we're going to do in order to, um, you know, like I have up there already, is another thing we're going to do to try and keep it more approachable is to try and keep it small. Um, so that we're not including every possible thing from category theory that can be done just to do it. Um, we're trying to uh, ask that things that are be brought into the library um, have an obvious motivation. So it... Um, we're not looking for you to say, you know, theoretically, I could use this thing in this way, and category theory says that, you know, if I can't immediately say, you know, how am I going to use that thing, I want your, I'm going to ask you to say, show me an example where this is actually useful, so that um, it's not in there occupying more space than it's earning. Um, so while we're doing this, um, uh, uh, and we're making these choices, or maybe we're changing things to be more approachable, we're trying really hard not to um, compromise the principles. We're trying to make sure that everything is lawful, and we'll talk more about laws later, but we're trying to make sure that, um, you know, that we don't, we don't compromise our uh, functional programming standards in order to make things more approachable. So we still want to keep everything pure. We're going to keep everything, you know, purely functional and law-abiding. That having said, we're totally willing to compromise on our credentials. Uh, <laughs> I mean, on our, on our principles, when it's earning its keep. Um, and so we will make some. We will. We will we're going to allow some things in that maybe are lawless, if they are earning their place. That is, they're saying that um, they're providing enough value that it's. That we're going to, you know, say, okay, maybe I can't reason about this totally, but it's, you know, uh, and because sometimes there are things that are just so useful that you you want to have them. Um, Okay, so more goals that we have um, is that it's been, uh, I don't know how annoying I am to Eric Osheim and Cody Allen, another person who is a heavy contributor to, uh, to CATS, 
These are some of the most anal attentive uh, developers on the planet, which is great, but I'm sure I'm driving them crazy because they are wanted to be, you know, I've had to change Emacs setting to make sure my stars on my comments line up just right and that, you know, no trailing white space, you know, everything. And so they're, they're very, um, as soon as I, I just throw the pull request in there, I'm like, here you go, here's some stuff. And they're like, um, Stu, your stars aren't lining up in here, you know. So these guys are, you know, especially because we're starting from scratch and it's not like, you know, code coming from here, code coming from there. We're like, they're being great gatekeepers about like, we're going to write things all the same way. And we're thinking about things like, you know, when we're passing in um, implicit parameters where you can use like a, a context bound, um, uh, which is shorthand for having an implicit parameter passed in, you know, when are we going to do one versus when are we going to do another? And we're, you know, we're, we're actually having long conversations about style, um, trying to make sure that everything is written in a very clear, coherent, and very consistent way. Um, uh, and we've uh, tried as much as we can to leverage the tools we have, um, like, you know, style of style and stuff. So, and I'm terrible, I, you know, I'll throw a commit in there and then fail Jenkins, or not Jenkins, Travis will tell me it's no good because of twirling white space somewhere. Um, so another goal is that we are trying as much as possible to make everything serializable. Um, and some of you probably are not sure why we care about serializable. I mean, this is, I'm talking about Java serializable. Um, who knows why? I know you know why, Delbert. Spark, exactly. Um, it's because, you know, anytime you're doing a Spark and you have, you're writing code, which might be shipped off to some, some slave, they use Java serialization right now, I think, you know, and so, um, but we're just trying to be very active about putting it everywhere we possibly can so that we, you know, because a lot of us who are using this stuff are ending up writing code that's going to end up in Spark at some, at some point. Um, Scaladoc, everywhere. I, I'm, I'm trying to go through and make sure that every method we have has ScalaDoc attached on it. And this is somewhat of a difference from some of the attitudes that some people have in ScalaZ, and this is not, um, you know, there, there's, I think that they're both completely different um, and totally valid um, ways of thinking about it. But you'll see some people in the ScalaZ community who will say, I don't need the documentation because the types of the documentation. Uh, and I think that's, that's true to some extent. Uh, and I think it's, it, would it, you know, when I started learning all this stuff, I started learning all this stuff from Scala Z, and I did learn how to read the type signature and learned that the type signature really is fantastic documentation. Between type signatures and laws, you should know everything you need to know. However, uh, that doesn't work for everybody. And I think it's, you know, it's hard to say that adding the Scala doc everywhere is worse. Um, so I'm, we're just going to err on the side of, you know, try to document as much as possible so it, that, Again, that person who's coming along who might be a little bit intimidated might have a, 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 you know, something to read that'll help a lot more than reading a bunch of one letter type signature name, you know. So, so we are trying to Scala doc everything. The other goal is that we have is, of course, search engine optimization. That's why we chose cats as a really horrible name. <laughs> <sighs> All right, so, um, um, we'll talk about, uh, some of the type classes that are in there. I'm going to assume that most of you are in here are familiar with what these type classes are. I wasn't planning on going into and talking about like what is a functor or what is a monad, um, but you know just just talk about what we've got um, if you're familiar with this stuff. So we have kind of the ones we're hoping that we have all the ones that you use all the time. So you know functor is something that comes up all the time. The applicative functor monads come up all the time, and so these you know we're trying to make sure that all these things that 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 we're all using, you know, all the things that we actually use all the time for Scala Z are the first things that we put in there. Um, traverse, of course, um, that's the one that you will hear a bunch of us say that 50% uh, of all questions that come into the Pound Scala Z channel, the answer is Traverse. Uh, so that was one of the first ones going there. Some of them are missing, however, um, and that's because um, some of them are, are, we get from algebra. Uh, and the, those, the ones that we're getting right now are monad and semigroup, also equal. Um, and so what the Algebra Project is, Algebra Project is another project started by Eric, the same guy who started the CAS project. And it tries, it's trying to be some common ground um, for different libraries who are going to share some of the same concepts. 
So in there, they've got a, mona, a monoid and a semi-group. And the, 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 the initial motivation, it was started by him and it was started by some, uh, some guys from Twitter so that there could be a common language for trading ideas between Spire and Algebird. Um, so that they said, why don't we, you know, we all are using these monoids, why don't we agree, we'll put a very small, lean um, implementation of, uh, and definition of what is a monoid, um, what is a semi-group, and we could share those. And then hopefully that it will uh, ease some work on developers at some point down the road who are trying to use both libraries. Uh, in there they also have um, a bunch of other type classes that we're not using yet. So they have, you know, they, they have things like um, abelian monoids, you know, monoids where, where not just associativity is guaranteed, but uh, commutativity is, is in, and stuff like that. And we're not using those yet, but we, uh, I think at some point we'll probably add those as well. Um, there are some things that we're missing, and I, and I, you know, I kind of alluded to this earlier. There's some things that are in Scala Z that we don't have, but we don't have them, and I think it's a good thing. And some of these things are, are these guys. And these are the things that when you look at the Scala Z project and look at all the things that are there, sometimes you look at them and you're like, okay, what is this thing? What is a con extension? And it's like, it, it's a thing. It's an interesting thing to learn about. It's, I bet you there is no one in this room who has ever in their time of functional programming said, you know what? This is a right Xhan extension over identity. You know, like who? Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. You don't count. Not, but you, <laughs> you haven't done it in Scala. How about that? <laughs> uh, and, and, and so, you know, we've decided that a lot of these things, if they're not something that, that come up and the things that we don't use, um, we're just going to leave them out for now because we think the library is better um, and more approachable if we just don't stick everything in that's category theory for category theory's sake. Um, and other things along the same line, you know, adjunctions. Adjunctions, if you read, once you start reading category theory books, you know, you'll see things like adjunctions are everywhere. And if you take one thing away from category theory, learn to recognize that adjunctions are everywhere. That might be the case. They're nowhere in people's Scala projects. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, so we're not going to have them for right now. Um, lenses is an interesting one. Um, lenses are a super useful concept. Uh, and Scala Z does have lenses, and they are super useful, and they're fun. Um, however, I think the, the, what's happened is, what's come along is there's a monocle project. Um, and if you guys aren't familiar with it, you should check it out. It's a really, really great lens library. And I think that what's happening is a lot of people who, would be, who are using Scala Z are not using the Scala Z lenses, or they're starting to move towards monocle. Um, and I think we're kind of, it's one of those things where I think there's a lot of, you know, if you look at the lenses we have in Scala Z and you look at the lenses they have in Monocle, the lenses of Monocle are, are far more mature. And then you go look at something like Ed Komet's lens library for, for Haskell and it's like, okay, there's a whole lot more we could be doing. And I think that it's one of those instances where we're going to say, I think that that development's going to happen in the Monocle space and we're going to, you know, we're going to stay away from it. Um, and which I think is probably where Scala Z is headed, is that we might see in some future major rewrite of Scala Z that it no longer has lens. Um, so there, uh, there's a few things that we, uh, hopefully that's, you guys can read that. Um, there's a few things that we've renamed. Uh, uh, yeah. You said we could stop you. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm, just, I'm not gonna argue, I'm just curious about yeah. representable and why, because and, you mentioned you don't include that. And I think that one's actually really useful. I think it is. It's just one that, you know, it's one that is, I, I, I do see that that one is being useful. It's just one that most of us just haven't become familiar about. Uh, and, and there aren't, it's one where, you know, if you look at the Scala Z source code, there are no examples. If you search around for people using representable functors in, in Scala, you won't find, I, I, bet, I bet you won't find a single example other than, okay, so here's the thing, I feel like I should try and use it. So I'm trying to use it to try and use it for a toy. But I, I wonder if you'll even find that with representable functors. So it's a type of thing where if you were to come along and, and come up with a pull request for cats that says, here's representable functors, it'd be like, great, show me some example code that makes, that motivates me to say, like, this is something I want to have, right? So, I mean, there's certainly, you know, in like distributive functors or another one, or one the distributive type class, which is another one, you know, like another thing that works like like traverse and applicative to like turn structures inside out. Another one, definitely useful and definitely even comes up. It's just one that you don't find a lot of motivating examples to have yet. So when they come along, we're happy to include them. It's just that if, you know, it's also, you know, very new library and, you know, the things that have made it in so far are like the ones, you know, like Monad, use that all the time. Um, and so we use this opportunity um, of kind of starting scratch from scratch to rethink some of the names. So some of the names, that from Scala Z, we, we translate, uh, we, we, we changed um, some of these 
are, well, people might think they're good, some people might think they're bad. Um, we, some of these we toiled over a lot. Um, but, you know, we, we uh, so like the, some of the bigger ones, you know, plus became semi-group K. Plus was, is a, is like a semi-group. So if you're thinking, if you're familiar with semi-groups, whereas, um, you know, semi-group has, uh, is a type class uh, over fully specified types. So types that are, don't, that are, um, try, uh, you know, not type constructors like list, where, you know, list you might say, hear people say it's, kind star arrow star saying that it takes a concrete type and gives you back a concrete type. It has one type whole. Um, and that's what, you know, semi-group says, I need a fully specified type. Give me an A, another A, I can add them. I can add an int to an int. I can add a list of ints to a list of ints. Um, plus and plus empty are the, the um, what we might say, the universal quantified versions of these. These are um, just like the semi-group where we have an append to add an A to an A, but it is only works for types where they are type constructors. So it's um, things that have one type hole. So a list, we can add a list to a list or an option to an option. And they have slightly different semantics. Why yeah. K? Um, so that... Presumably kind. It's kind. Um, Which is somewhat inaccurate. But <laughs> yeah. <close enough. laughs> And I'm not guaranteeing these won't change again, um, but that the K came from the fact that it's a higher kinded semi-group. It's one, yeah. <laughs> not, not cat. Um, Better SEO. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and another one is that we we took the um, I, I don't the the one on the right on the bottom the the disjunction that we we renamed it XOR, which is for an exclusive OR, and then we renamed the other one, which people haven't seen as much, which is pronounced these, um, which is an inclusive OR. So, you know, if you guys are probably familiar with the exclusive OR that says either everything is either uh, a right or a left, um, the these, which is the inclusive OR, is everything is a right or a left or both. Um, uh, oh, my slide got broken. So validation became validated was the other one. Um, so talking a little more about the data types we have, we have the one and which Colt uh, talked about. Um, one and being a way of making a non-empty something. Um, so if you have a one and of list, it's a non-empty list. A one and of vector is a non-empty vector. You can make non-empty sets. You can make non-empty streams. Um, we don't have a non-empty list that stands alone from the one and. We don't have a separate one em non-empty list structure right now. That definitely could change. The one of the motivations to having a non-empty list um, which is separate from the one and type classes. There are a lot of uh, useful methods that you can put on to a non-empty list, which are specific to lists, um, which don't necessarily fit on the one and, which is too generic. We've got, I think I've managed to get more um, <coughs> methods on one and to make it more useful than one in Scala Z, but it's clearly there's, we, we could do better. Um, so we talked about XOR and IR, which is the exclusive OR and inclusive OR before, and the XOR does have a, a monad transformer now as well. Um, the validated type class is just like validation, like it, just like validation, um, just that we've named it, renamed it uh, from validation to validated, and we renamed the constructors from success and failure to valid and invalid. And people seem to like that. Um, we do have Clisely now. Um, uh, which is a reader T or a reader monad. Um, and that's about all we've got in there for data structures right now. I'm probably missing a couple. There's constant stuff, but, um, but we plan on adding more. This is, you know, this is just as far as we've gotten so far. Um, there, are so, there are a few that are missing that are, that are notoriously missing, like ones that we really, really want um, and we're really going to miss. Uh, a writer, which is, you know, somewhat similar, you know, similar to a reader, um, it's the it's left adjunct to a reader or something. Right, left, doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and RWST is, is a handy jam all the reader, the writer, the state all together in one big monad transformer. Um, so those are things that I'm sure will be coming. It's just a matter of someone's, no one's written down and banged out an implementation and made the pull request yet. The next two task and process are kind of uh, big ones. Um, you know, task is a is kind of maybe the current Scala Z implementation of an I/O uh, monad is one way to think of it. It's it's a way of modeling a computation which pr may perform side effects, may succeed, may fail. Um, it's one that I personally use 
all over the place. Anytime I'm writing code and I'm doing anything that might side effect or, you know, then I'm going to wrap it in a task. Um, and so my code is littered with task. And right now, task is in the Scala Z library. Um, and so we don't have a task implementation. Task uh, in Scala Z depends on the Scala Z, Scala Z uh, future implementation. Um, and it's a really hairy implementation, and it's one that's got some bugs on it. And it's a, and, uh, so I think that we're going to see a rewrite of task. Uh, I think there's one already in. Is, no, there's not one in Scala Z yet. But uh, there's, a, there's a rewrite of the hairy bits of future in Scala Z stream because we couldn't right. handle the bugs. Um, so like, yeah. like, future is basically this tiny shell that Scala Z stream uses, and then we like rewrite all of the interesting bits of it. Right. Um, but I, I was actually just going to ask you, like, I mean, I, I I wasn't aware that there was a strong interest in getting a task-like thing into cats. If there if there's an interest in that, we can do it. It's very easy. Well, it's so it's. It's, I don't know, I don't care necessarily, does it have to live in cats or does it have to live as a separate thing? Cats but I, 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 yeah, I don't know. Could be. It's just that, you know, when, when the people, so none of us, you know, I know that Travis has fooled around with putting cats into a library. Uh, and, and the people have said, okay, I, I, I ported my toy project from Scala Z to cats. Um, most of us who are developing cats aren't like going in my day job and being like, okay, guys, it's cats now, you know. And one of the reasons, the thing that's going to stop me from being able to do that is task. Like, I just need task to operate. And, and task is tied to Scala Z now. Like, you know, it, you know it, internally, the, the, it's, a, it's a disjunction and stuff like that. And, and so... more sense to have uh, task on Scala Z stream? That's, that's been talked about. Yeah. There's, a, there's a big issue about in, in the Scala Z stream... Uh, issues tracker right now about um, one of the things that Paul Chiasano said he might want to do is to pull task back into Scala Z stream. Um, so they have control over it, like Daniel's saying, like we need to fix the bugs ourselves. And you don't want to tie, they don't want to tie, Scala Z stream doesn't want to necessarily tie itself to the Scala Z release cycle. Yeah, so, so one of the things that, that might legitimately happen is, is task future and probably also actor, because actor basically just exists to support future. Um, we'll just move to Scala Z stream and yep. not be in Scala Z at all anymore. And right. If you if you want to have those data types, you'll just have to bring in Scala Z stream. And, and because Scala Z stream, we're trying to like we're, we're trying we're trying very hard at Scala Z stream not to pick a winner in terms of Scala Z versus cats like yeah. whose data types you use. Absolutely. So um, in in a very ideal world that may not actually be technically possible, you would be able to use task with either cats or Scala yeah. Z, and it would just work. You just have to go through Scala Z stream to get it. Yeah, and I, I think Paul has talked about even yeah pulling it away from Scala Z and maybe renaming it and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and you know another thing that we and I think we're going to see more of that. Like for instance, um, Mike Pilquist also has the um, S Codec project, which is a fantastic project. And if you're doing any yeah. kind of binary serialization, you should check out S Codec, and it's streaming it's alternative. Yeah, it's it's just so pleasant to work with. Um, you know what we, what we say a lot at work is like the highest. Uh, the highest compliment you can give any library is like, it's a very reasonable library to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 tell that, I tell people that if you need a reason to use Scala, S codec is sufficient. Yeah. And so when this all came up in the whole, uh, I think uh, Colt called it the switcheroo or something. Um, <laughs> um, when the whole switcheroo came up, Mike Pilquist did what I think we're going to see some other libraries to do is to say, I'm just going to pull back. I'm going to implement my own monad. And I don't need much from Scala Z or Cats. I don't want to pick a winner. Um, so maybe we'll see that happen with process and task. And those, but and my point is just that those are the kind of things that need to happen before I can wholeheartedly switch to, to Cats because I can't operate without task. And I'm starting to, right now, process is the big hammer I'm hitting all the nails with. That's fucking fun. <laughs> um, and so another thing that we're missing is, is tags, tag typed, which are super handy and useful in Scala Z. And that's just, I've been meaning to port it over and just haven't done it yet. Isn't there a like tagging in shapeless that we could just use yeah, instead? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, if yeah. you're using cats, cats and shapeless work together really well. So. I agree. Well, and hopefully even better soon. Um, so some things are out of scope for cats, we've decided. And these are things that were added to, these are data structures that were added to um, Scala Z along the way. And they're stuff that's not, they're super useful. And it's, well, sometimes they're, maybe you could, you know, maybe some of these are questionably useful. iList, for example is just a list. It's just a re-implementation of list that's trying to be a little better. It's the list that we wish was in the standard library. Um, the things that we like about it better are that um, you should entertain yourself sometime by looking up Rob Norris's T-Polecat's uh, diagram of 
all of the things that List inherits from in the, in the super top hierarchy. And it's like a huge page with like 30 things on it. You're like, wow, I knew it was a lot, but that's 35 super classes. Yeah, so <laughs> um, another thing is that I list, the I and I list comes from the fact that it's invariant. And that's a questionable thing. You know, there are reasons why it's nice to have a list that's, that's covariant, and there, um, but it can cause some problems. So. Um, one thing that list change, I list changes is to make lists not invariant. Um, and then another thing that it does is it just gets rid of the stupid method that shouldn't be there, like um, you know dot head. You should only, you should never. If you're calling dot head, you should you, you know, by convention you must anywhere you call dot head you must add a comment that says YOLO because <laughs> 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 you know. Um, Head option is the answer that you should be using. So um, going down, so there's also a maybe type in Scala Z, which is just like option, but again, doesn't have the dot get method where you must put YOLO. Um, and, uh, and it's also invariant. Um, and then the next one down is, uh, um, I had a coworker who would, that's, the, that's Scala Z's map, and it's a, it's, a, it's a map that's stored as a tree, but it's uh, an immutable map structure. Very nice structure to work with. Uh, again, doesn't have 35 super types and has a lot of the things that you said, God, why doesn't that map have that? Like, why don't I have something that's like update, and if it's not there, add it. If it is, combine it with a semi-group. Um, uh, that one lovingly referred to by a previous coworker of mine as the dick arrow. Um, uh, we're also missing finger tree, and we have no... Um, uh, Double-ended queue. These kind of things are stuff we've just decided this is not the business cats want to get into. Love to see some other library started up that says, okay, I want to do data structures right. Um, we just don't see that it's necessarily uh, a strong relationship to, to cats. Um, we had, you know, like I said before, it's been fun to like kind of rethink some of the old ideas we had um, that, you know, um, or just being able to think of, you know, new stuff that, that we could try. And we've had a couple that we've you know, we've had a couple notable ones that we've tried and said, you know, that was a bad idea. Let's forget it. Uh, one thing that came up, we were redoing disjunction. We were coming up with our new exclusive or, which went through about 25 different p possible names for, <laughs> we could call it, you know, uh, we could call it or, we could call it either, we could call it, you know, these things. And then the, the constructor names, it could be right and left, it could be good and bad, or good and evil, you know. Um, uh, and I think uh, good and bad or good and evil are the ones that Scalactic uses. Um, is that right? It's good or bad or good and evil, I don't remember. And that's uh, Bill Venner's library. Um, and he can't got in and started talking to us and made a really good case for trying to tell us that our exclusive or should be left biased, which was a really interesting discussion. Um, and so we actually considered uh, making it left biased so that it would be the, the good values on the left and the errors on the right. And that was one where... My good friend Rob Norris over here sent me an in, uh, instant message or an IRC message saying, hey, Stu, get over the GATS channel because I'm about to lay down in front of the bulldozer over this right bias, left bias <laughs> issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we ultimately decided that we really do need to stick with a right-based uh, um, exclusive or, or just right biased in general. Um, another one that which, which is, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm curious. Okay. Yeah. I'll give you. Here's the here's the example that convinces me. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, let's say uh, when you when you talk about the monad instance, right? You're going to write the monad instance on XOR of some maybe XOR where the errors are strings, yeah. and the the parameter we're leaving free is this one over here. Now let's talk about XORT, which is the monad transformer over some, some monad, and string is the error, and here is the thing I'm abstracting over. And that, like the, um, although we don't have this in Scala, we don't have type currying like we do in Haskell, it does seem to um, be easier to, 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 to remember or think about where we have this parameter that we're the one that we're, that we're letting vary, the one that we're keeping free is always the last one. Like this, you know, having, Having that thing stuck in the middle, um, this this kind of like right, yeah. Um, so I don't. It just it just it just feels more natural to most of us, I think. And I, you know, so what's that? <laughs> it is right. 
So another one we, 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 uh, that I played around with, and I actually have a working implementation uh, of, is using, um, trying to do some trickery, some maybe some nasty little things um, to try and have maybe just one sum type. Um, it's an interesting idea. I don't think it's fully fleshed out, but um, something where you know we have these things like uh, validation, which has a left value and a right value, success failure, however you want to call it. Uh, we have an you know an either. We have a disjunction. We have you know um, all of these different things that have the exact same structure. Is that you know they're a product of t of two types, um, and we talked about in the Scala Z talk how we have one of them which um, operates monadically where. You can only have one error, and things must be strictly sequenced. And one that is a, works in an applicative manner, where we can accumulate errors, and we can, you know, one one computation doesn't depend on the result of another computation. And so, when you're using these things, you might have to, when you need one behavior versus the other, switch from one type to another. Um, you know, so another way you could do this perhaps is to have a generic product of two things and then use tags or some other way or some nasty is instance of trick um, to be able to switch the behavior without necessarily causing another allocation. Um, but it's not one that we're really, the idea really didn't go anywhere. Um, all right. Any questions before we move on? Um, so one thing that we've tried to do is to modularize the, the, the project a little more. Uh, and this is something, I'm not sure if it's, uh, this is one where there's going to be some pushback on this. Uh, but the idea is that we wanted to have a really tight, uh, small core. So you could, you know, I think there's some people that had this, this idea of like, well, I don't want to pull that, pull that whole huge Scala Z library into my, I don't want that on my class path. Um, and I'm not sure that that's, that's a well-founded idea, um, but we were trying to have just a, a really tiny core that had just the type classes that we needed to do functional programming uh, and, and try to not bring anything else into it. Uh, and then have we have the STD, the standard stuff, which is the type class instances for the standard library. So for example, uh, in core is where you're going to have something like functor. And in standard is where you're going to have something like list has a valid functor. Um, or option has a valid functor. So all the things, of, you know, all, all of the type class instances for the stuff in the standard library would go there. Um, uh, then we have a separate project where we're just packaging the laws. Um, the laws which say things like uh, a monoid has to be associative or um, says that uh, a functor, when you map on the identity function, you don't change the original value. So those kinds of laws are stuck in there. Um, we'll talk about docs in a bit, but uh, docs is, the, is a sub-project where we're generating all of the documentation for the project. Um, and that includes, um, and that's, you know, it's where we generate the website from, it's what generates the Scala doc and stuff like that. Free, um, we have a free Monad imp implementation, um, and we've stuck it in a separate project called free. And this is one, the reason it's in its own project is I think that um, how many people here are, are like using the free monad and, and are like writing interpreters for free algebras and doing that fun stuff that Runar likes to talk about? If you're not, you should try and do it. It's a fun exercise and it's really worth it. Um, we're starting to do it everywhere. Um, but you know, uh, this this idea of of using free in order to uh, you know model your domain and then be able to write interpreters that perform the the actual uh, nasty I/O and stuff that it needs to to do your actual business. Um, it's an idea that's really hot in the FP Scala world right now. And I think, you know, like Scala Z Stream, where, uh, you know, you need, we want to iterate those things separately from Scala Z. We think that this uh, free, because it's becoming so hot and we're having new ideas about it, and there's lots of ways that things could be better as far as being more efficient when you're doing this maybe not so efficient way of computation, that we want to keep that so it can iterate a little bit separately. Um, but, the last one on my list, state, that is an artifact of why maybe this modularization is not a good idea. <laughs> because um, what has happened is that we've, you know, we've, we, had the, we started with this, this, this idea of grandeur that will make everything very modular and very small and, and, and just you know, interdependencies between them. But then we realized right away, like we used to have a separate data project where we had things like you know, our exclusive OR type and our... Um, uh, you know, all of the, you know, the, that's where the Kleisley lives and this and that. But then we very quickly said, all right, I actually need some of that stuff in core. So now we had to pull that stuff into core. 
And now we have a problem in core where anyone who's done a lot of pure functional programming in, um, in Scala has realized eventually you probably need a trampoline <laughs> um, because um, you, know, you can't do monadic computation, for example, in a, in a stack safe way in Scala without using something like trampolines. And since the most you know, common, commonly what you'll see and what is done in Scala Z is that trampolines are, are built on top of a free monad. So because trampolines are based on free, we don't get to use, and free is in its own project, we don't get to use trampolines in core, which is a bit of an issue. And now because state being that monadic computation that you can't do in a stack safe way needs a trampoline, now we have this extra state project, which we've only had since like Wednesday, which, depend, which is its own project only because it depends on free and in core. Doesn't need to be. A trampoline could be your monad that you're operating over, but Clisley is very useful without right, state. I mean to be um, sure. Sure. Yeah, but I mean, your general solution is that you have to go over the monad. Just build more stacks of transformers. Yeah. It's very unreasonable. Yeah. Your target is typically going to be something like transformers. Yeah. The target is always cast. Okay, so uh, if there are any questions, I'm gonna, I was going to run through really quickly um, one, uh, one, one, one very specific example I thought was really interesting that came out of, um, you know what, actually, forget it, I'm going to skip that one. Because we're running longer on time than we thought. Um, all right, I, wanted, uh, I was going to start to talk about some of the, so um, some of the other cool things that, that happened um, because we were starting this pro uh, project fresh, is that we were um, able to make use of some of the, the some some cool new um, technology in Scala that which is making our lives a lot easier. And I just wanted to highlight some of them because some of them are are super fun and things that you should be checking out for your own project. The first one I threw some slides in just because Colt told me I had to in his talk, which is about Kind Projector. Um, so uh, the idea behind Kind Projector it's a it's it's a it's a Compiler plugin that's been around for a long time, and I don't. For some reason, just just now we got it into Scala Z like a couple months ago, and we're using it in um, Cats. It's the one that lets you get rid of. Uh, if you look at um, the the second line there, so so the, the idea here is the first line we want to write. We want to use some monad for our exclusive or type. That's our disjunction, but we can't do that because it's in the wrong shape. Monad wants you to be um, defined for some type class that looks like this. It's got one hole, but XOR has two, right? Uh, it's got an error and a success type. So it's the wrong shape, so that, does, that first one doesn't work. It doesn't compile. Um, you've probably seen, if you played around with Scala Z very, uh, for a while, you've seen the second one, which is called a type lambda. And the idea is it does some, this is like something that someone figured out you could do um, not like a planned feature, but it's just, it's defining, if you look at it and you try to break this down, it's really not that bad once you understand what's going on. It's like, you're defining an anonymous structure that's got a single type alias in it. And that type alias has the right shape because we fixed this one. So now we have this type alias, we'll pull it out of there, and that's the thing that we're doing. So what we've done is we've just, we've taken two holes and we filled one with string there. Um, you can get around this by defining your type alias just defining a type alias. Here I have a string error, which now string error is in the right shape, so this works. Um, now, why wouldn't you just do that all the time? You typically do, but there are situations like the very last one where uh, we need to refer to, this is a scary type signature that comes out of the cat's library that we need, and I don't want to tell you what it does, but the thing I want you to, <laughs> <laughs> the thing I want you to understand is the reason I can't do this trick to simplify where I define a, a type alias and just use a type alias is that this type where I need the hole uh, is defined inside earlier in, in, the, uh, in the method definition. So I don't have no place to define the type alias, so I have to do it here. So this used to be that big scary type lambda, but now I get to rid of the whole thing and just, just say the, what the kind projector plugin lets you do is just say stick the question mark where you want the hole to be, and then we get to you know, uh, it, yeah, quick noting that Scala 3 is going to have a really nice solution to this. You want, like, it'll be as clean as this is, uh, but you want to use a compiler plugin. Yeah. So that's going to be really good. 
Okay. Another one, since we're running short on time, is discipline. That's what we use for our law checking. I didn't talk much about laws. I thought I would end up talking about laws a lot. Uh, it's a super nice plugin that lets you um, write the law. So a lot of these things, like Functor, um, they're a lot of these concepts that come from category theory that become so useful because they're so general. And what they let let us do is to, uh, you know, manipulate our programs algebraically. Um, and what I mean by that is just think of, you know, think of when you have an algebra problem like 2x equals 10. Like I, I, I can figure out what x is because I can manipulate this algebraically. This is what we learned in algebra. As I learned that since these things follow certain laws, I can just apply things and say like, take the x over here and put the, the 2 and put it over here and you know, solve for x. I, I want to be able to do the same thing with my code and see things like I have a map. I, I have you know, fa map f map g. I know I can change that into fa map g compose f. Um, and I can do that only because these things are following laws. So for instance, I'm, you know, I'm defining that law down here that says that fa map f then map g is the same as um, mapping over just a composite function. Um, so we have some nice thing. Discipline is a nice library. It lets me just write my laws like that and then run Scala check to check that my list monad is actually behaving correctly. This one, simulacrum, is one that I'm super excited about. Um, it's another one from Mike Pilquist, who I've mentioned several times. Um, it, what it tries to do is try to standardize how we deal with type classes um, and type class instances uh, in order to eliminate a lot of boilerplate. So here is how you might define a semigroup. Um, um, this is how it's defined in cats, is that we just say that a semigroup just has a single method called combine. Just takes two A's, combine them to a single, single A. All we're going to do is we're going to add um, just these annotations to say that um, by the way, semigroup is also a type class. Um, and then what Simulacrum is going to do is generate all this code for us, all this boilerplate code. Um, and there's not much of interest here, which is another reason why you don't want to write it yourself. Um, but there's a couple things that it lets us do which are super handy and we want to do all the time. For example, in the first thing here, what I'm doing is I've called semigroup int. Um, and that's calling an apply method that's been added by Simulacrum, which lets me conjure up a semigroup for int if one is in implicit scope, and then just call the method on it. Uh, and I don't have to write that apply method on some object called semigroup. That just comes for free just by putting that type class annotation. Another is that I get this syntax. I can, uh, and how I've gotten that is just if we go back to my definition, you see that I just put uh, the op um, annotation on there to say um, this thing is. Uh, an operator, which I want you to have a type alias, uh, I'm sorry, a, and a method alias for to say you can call that with pipe plus pipe. Um, and that just all of a sudden works. And that works by adding lots of implicits for you, stuff that you don't have to write yourself, but you get this handy syntax. Um, and so that's simulacrum. Moving fast because we're running out of time. Uh, I, one huge thing that, uh, that I, my favorite part of the entire CATS project, um, and if you look, uh, I'm someone who likes to, is pretty good at making you think I know what I'm talking about, but really all I do on these projects, like Scala Z, I'm one of the top committers, Katz, I'm the top committer, all I'm doing is actually just writing documentation. <laughs> I don't actually write any of the code. Um, so I'm super excited about this stuff. Um, our, our documentation for Katz is, first of all, I think it's good. I do say so myself, um, but it's, uh, it's compiler verified, and that's done with a... a, a uh, SBT plugin from Rob over there called Tut. And um, what it lets you do is it lets you write um, some uh, markdown in your readmes that have uh, these code blocks that are labeled by Tut. They're referred to, did you make up the term Tut sheds? They're called Tut sheds. Okay. So what it lets me do is in my documentation, <laughs> in my markdown, I get to have a Tut shed that has some code. Right? What happens is the Tut actually runs at compile time and converts it into a REPL session. So what it actually does is fires up a REPL and shoves your code into the REPL and replaces your markdown with now a Scala shed, which has the exact uh, running your, your, your documentation through a REPL. And when, so what the result is, is that if we change some code in CATS and our examples, our written documentation, aren't right anymore, it fails the build. So we have to fix the documentation when we fix it. <laughs> so, applause.